plans all revolve around the importance of trying to integrate the uh, needs and the comfort and the enjoyment of our visitors with the same for the residents. So many places who have attempted the extent of restoration that we are have become museum villages and we very much want to stay a living community and be a place where the arts and crafts and heritage of this area is available to the visitor in a, in a hands-on experience. Historic Rugby is now launching an accelerated campaign to become better known to the public and at the same time preserve its charm and culture which dates back to the 1880s when English author and social reformer Thomas Hughes founded the colony. In doing this, Hughes was attempting to solve a problem which was unique to the younger sons of the English gentry. By law, they were excluded from inheritance and unable to enter into some of the socially accepted professions of the time. So Hughes established his colony in America and encouraged these young men to leave England and come to this wooded and sparsely settled area on the Cumberland Plateau near Sedgemoor, hoping that their energies would be directed to the manual trades in agriculture and that some of the people living nearby who were farmers and skilled craftsmen would also be attracted and give the new colony a strong base. On a visit to this historic place for Tennessee Kaleidoscope, I talked with director Barbara Stagg, but before the conversation recorded an excerpt from a slide presentation describing rugby in those early days. The industrious members of the colony set to work improving their community, and even the remittance men helped to build and maintain the road to the Sedgemoor station. With the installation of a sawmill, tents were soon replaced by spacious homes, many typical of the Victorian Gothic cottage style. Soon the village boasted the first newspaper in the vicinity, a cooperatively owned store, boarding school, church, stables, a dairy, and one of America's finest collections of Victorian literature in their new library. Rugby had a horticultural society, public purposes association, lawn tennis club, and cricket team. Evenings were filled with the music of string and brass bands and the orations of the drama society. Yet all was not well in rugby. The colony flourished briefly, then deteriorated. About 20 years ago, restoration began, and now the number of visitors is increasing every year due to the semi-annual festivals, special Christmas events, and also developments in the surrounding area. That's partly because of rugby's growing reputation and so forth as an important historic site, and also because of the developing Big South Fork National River and Recreation Area. It's a 103,000 acre uh, national park that is to primarily preserve the the beautiful river gorges that are in our area, but also to provide outdoor recreation opportunities. Along with the visiting tourists, the residential population of Rugby is increasing. For many, many years, our population was slowly going down, slowly dwindling. And for the first time, we feel like we're starting to go in the other direction. It's again possible for people to start considering a permanent home in Rugby in the, in the surrounding area. And they can come here, too, for weekends and vacations. Oh, yes, and yes, all. we have. Of course, with the lodging at Newberry House and Pioneer Cottage, there's a lot of opportunity for both uh, exploring the history of this area and, of course, for lovely outdoor recreation. One of the recently restored inns is Newberry House, the colony's first boarding house. This Victorian-style building was completely restored and opened to guests in 1985. Here's proprietor Marianne Gehring. The woodwork is all original, and so are the floors, most of the windows. It was intended to house the young English men as they came over and waited for their homes to be constructed. It is now a guest home again and uh, furnished with original pieces of the period. The stairway is so narrow and that's so typical, isn't it? That is typical and it was horrible to get furniture up and down. It really was. Visitors are welcome in historic rugby at the schoolhouse visitor center, the restored church, the library, the cafe, and at various times the privately owned homes are open. The next project is the construction of an outdoor amphitheater for music and dance programs and uh, dramatic interpretations of life in rugby more than a hundred years ago. This program made possible with the joint support of the National Endowment for the Arts and the Tennessee Arts Commission. For Tennessee Kaleidoscope, this is Lynn Folk.
very few writers uh, can, can go into an interview and know exactly what they're going to want from that interview or what they're going to be able to use from that interview. And uh, a cassette a recording or a tape recording of any sort allows a writer to, uh, to do the interview, to sit back, to reflect upon what's there, and perhaps to a year later pick something out of the interview that, that he had not thought was even important earlier, and it becomes exactly the thing you want. Charles K. Wolf, MTSU professor of English and authority on folklore, has untold numbers of cassettes in his collection, each one with unlimited potential. He's incorporated the use of tape recordings in his own style of writing, both in books and articles. Some of his books are Grand Old Opry, The Early Years, Tennessee Strings, a popular book on the history of country music, and Everybody's Grandpa, The Life of Opry Star Grandpa Jones. Here's more from author Charles Wolfe in this conversation for Tennessee Kaleidoscope. I'm a great believer in, in the perfect anecdote. Uh, you know, Hemingway talked at one point about you know, the one perfect exact word that you had to use. Well, I believe that, that history is effective if you can choose the one perfect anecdote to illustrate a particular point. I think it makes your books more readable, for one thing, and it makes them more honest. So a lot of times I will plow through an interview and I will sit on it for six months until I decide exactly what story in that interview sums up the point that needs to be made. And we wouldn't be able to do that if you didn't have the cassette recordings. The other thing I think that's, that's so nice about cassettes is that it allows you to, to get a, a subject involved without the subject being so self-conscious. Uh, of course, the person knows your tape recording, but a cassette recorder is small and unobtrusive. And I've had the experience when I've used an open reel recorder of, of sitting there and, and watching my subject just get hypnotized by those twirling reels of tape in front of him and becomes very, very self-conscious about what's going on. Whereas as a small cassette recorder sitting over to the side, a person pretty soon forgets it's there. From these people whom Charles Wolfe has interviewed has come a wealth of folklore and a broad range of folk culture history. All of this with expanding possibilities, even involving present-day large corporations. Basically, folklore is not only, uh, as many people have assumed in the past, it's not only verbal lore like ballads and stories and proverbs, which is what it was once considered. It's expanded today to where we now include not only the old mountain verbal lore, but uh, all kinds of traditional expressive behavior, and it can range uh, all the way from a process, how you make something, how you put something together, to a working style. Uh, it can involve people working in factories. It can involve uh, beliefs. It can involve language. Uh, it's uh, expanded considerably beyond the old, what I call the old foxfire attitude of folklore. And uh, there are people, for example, today, corporations are hiring uh, people trained in folklore uh, to help them deal with the fact that sometimes a corporation creates its own culture and folklorists are trained in, in, in perceiving this and understanding it and dealing with it. So it's a, uh, it's a much broader sort of subject than it once was. And in Tennessee, we have a lot more people doing this kind of work than we once did. Uh, we have several centers now uh, for folklore in the state. There's one at Memphis. There's East Tennessee uh, State University. Uh, there are plans to develop centers like this in Nashville. And the state in itself has a large number of, of folklorists who are working uh, all the way again from Memphis and Martin to Johnson City and Kingsport. The state of Tennessee is a leader in promoting and using the talents of folklorists. This became especially evident last year in Washington. The Smithsonian Institution was doing its uh, research to decide which Tennesseans would be brought to Washington for the Festival of American Folklife. They were impressed with the number of people we had working down here and the fact that we really did have a lot of folklorists in Tennessee and people who were really getting out and doing the work and, and understanding what was going on. Uh, a lot of states still don't have this, and I'm proud that Tennessee has developed into a, a state where there is quite a bit of activity along this line. Folklorist, author, and lecturer, Dr. Charles K. Wolfe. This program made possible with the joint support of the National Endowment for the Arts and the Tennessee Arts Commission. For Tennessee Kaleidoscope, this is Lynn Folk.
it occurred to me at the time that while I wasn't at all interested in, in simply ghostwriting an uh, autobiography for somebody, that Grandpa would be different because, first of all, he himself is quite a historian. He, he has had the good sense to save uh, a great deal of the paperwork and the uh, various song books and song sheets and correspondence and this sort of thing. So uh, unlike a lot of situations where you simply had to take a person's word for what happened, Grandpa had this huge basement full of documentation. When Dr. Charles K. Wolf collaborated with Lewis M. Jones, better known as Grandpa Jones, in writing the book Everybody's Grandpa, he had more than one reason for doing this. For Tennessee Kaleidoscope, he explained that the book is more than just the story of grand old Opry star Grandpa Jones. It's a piece that contains much history as well. He was um, interested not only in telling his own story, but in telling the story of an entire era of country music, which had been pretty much forgotten about. This is the, the age in the 1930s and 40s when uh, country music singers were first really beginning to, to make it. Uh, on their own uh, to make a full-time living and it was an age where they would have to play little radio stations around the country and then drive halfway across the state at night to play a, a little schoolhouse and it was a rough uh, difficult and extremely interesting life and he wanted to talk about this as well. The book, Everybody's Grandpa, published in 1984 by the University of Tennessee Press, was different from most biographies and autobiographies. It was the result of a genuine collaboration, rather than a situation where author and English professor Wolf was simply doing ghostwriting for Jones. Grandpa's involvement in this was more than just simply uh, uh, checking over the manuscript or, or sitting down and giving me a bunch of press releases. Uh, he and I had a long series of conversations together that lasted over two years, and he actually did some of the writing himself. When he got to a point uh, in the manuscript where it was really difficult for him to talk about it, such as uh, the death of his friend String Bean, uh, he felt the best thing to do was to write it himself, which he did, and I very seldom had to do much to it. He, he's a good writer, and his, his writing reflects his natural, easy way of speaking. Charles Wolfe and Grandpa Jones spent a lot of time talking to people and chasing down leads and assembling information. It was sort of fun, and it was, I, th I think, a sort of different type of book than his, has been out before because... While a lot of country music singers have written their stories with, with journalists or freelance writers, uh, I can't think of too many cases where there's been a real collaboration between a, a well-known star and a person who has had you know, some, some historical background or some folklore training. And so this was, this was an experiment, and uh, we were trying to produce a book that would have an appeal to a general audience, but would also have an appeal to, to historians and to students of culture and students of folklore. And it might have been that to try to create this kind of hybrid was simply impossible, but we wanted to try it, and I'll let the readers, I guess, decide whether we succeeded. <laughs> I noticed in there the references to a lot of historical events like um, uh, before World War II, mm -hmm. uh, invasion of Poland and all of that was referred to, and uh, much more than a career in country music. That's part of what we wanted to do in, in a sense of giving the flavor of the times. Uh, it's important, I think, to understand that as you uh, read about Grandpa's career during this period, to put it into perspective by, by looking at the larger social events that were occurring that had an effect on him. And this is why we were kind of self-conscious all the way through the book of saying, okay, you know, here's what happened in the 40s, here's what he was doing when Pearl Harbor was bombed, here's how he got to Germany as an MP and became a singer on German radio, uh, here's what happened in the 50s when rock and roll hit. Uh, it's important to keep that kind of perspective. I think this is true of any biography. If you narrow it down to the point where all you have is a person's day-to-day -day events, uh, it first of all becomes rather boring, and in second, it, be, it sort of defeats the purpose in reading a biography because we do read biographies to get understanding about what happened in the past and, and how these people related to these events in the past. And this is why we wanted to, to put some of that in, in Grandpa's book. Everybody's Grandpa also includes a complete discography of Grandpa Jones' recordings from 1943 to 1983, a bibliography of his songbooks, historical photographs, and many anecdotes from his date books, scrapbooks, and other memorabilia, which he shared with author Charles Wolfe. This program, made possible with the joint support of the National Endowment for the Arts and the Tennessee Arts Commission. For Tennessee Kaleidoscope, this is Lynn Folk.
Every painting that I've done since Jericho, almost every painting, uh, will go in this new book. Chattanooga artist Hubert Schiffrein is making a tour introducing his new book, Home to Jericho, the first book he's done since 1974 when he and author James Dickey collaborated on a book about the South, Jericho, the South Beheld. As he just said for Tennessee Kaleidoscope, all of his work since 1974 has gone into the new book, which contains his own narrative and 91 watercolors of people and landscapes in the southern region, where he and his wife Phyllis traveled, spending many weeks tape recording conversations with the people he chose to paint and uh, making sketches of the scenes which had special appeal for him. Andrew Wyeth said in one of his books uh, that he thought that one's art goes only as deep as one's love goes. I totally agree with that. And I have said that nothing can happen without that doesn't come from within. These paintings that I do, these watercolors that I do, are real places and real things and real people that I love. Uh, if I'm doing someone's face, it's especially important to get to know that person. And it's a great privilege to be an artist and to be able to sit with people, get to know them, and somehow bridge the gap and somehow have the painting take on something of the quality of that person's uh, real essence. And when it happens, it's, it's like magic. Are you surprised when you see the result? Yes. I am surprised that uh, one out of ten will finally end up as a finished painting, you bet. <laughs> when you paint, do you have music going in the background? I would like to, s to say yes, but uh, I find that I do my best work in total silence. I know this sounds strange, but being an artist is a lonely life, and when young people come to me and ask me about being a full-time painter. I try to tell them that uh, having the, the talent, the God-given gift, is just one ingredient. They must have the education. They must have uh, the stickability that it takes to spend many, many hours into many, many years at the easel. They must also have the willingness to almost go into exile because unlike other jobs where you have other people around uh, to rely on, but when you're in that studio facing that blank piece of paper or that blank canvas, it's only you and no one else around. So I try to uh, have total silence and to let my subconscious speak and somehow to get it down on the paper. Does anyone else see the painting before it's finished? Like, does your wife come in and look at it? Or do you wait until it's completely finished? Sometimes I like uh, feedback, but most of the time, no. Because if I were working on a painting right now and you came in and said, gee, that's terrific, then I'd be afraid to touch it and finish it, afraid I might make a mistake. On the other hand, if you said, well, I'm not sure I like this or that, then I'd be discouraged and, again, wouldn't want to finish it. So I like to wait until I think I'm finished before I get the opinion of someone else. Uh, to add further to working in silence, when I'm doing the real creative part of a painting, that is, in the initial stages, I work in total silence. But then the painting reaches a certain point where it's just a matter of editing and pulling things together. And sometimes that's uh, the most time-consuming part of all. Then I don't mind having music or background noise or people in the room or what have you. But it, in the initial stages, I like to be totally alone and by myself. Watercolor artist Hubert Schiptrein, whose latest book is Home to Jericho, published by Oxmoor House. This program, made possible with the joint support of the National Endowment for the Arts and the Tennessee Arts Commission. For Tennessee Kaleidoscope, this is Lynn Folk.
I try to apply the Native American ways to contemporary issues and, and problems and use the stories as they were in, intended in the culture. With all Native Americans, the, the stories are not just stories. They're specifically designed to entertain and to instruct and to empower, to give you a touch with a universal truth that will help you with your life now. So they're viewed as living stories, and every generation reinterprets the myth. But that's somewhat different, I believe, than in the dominant culture where stories are basically seen as stories and, and entertaining, but not necessarily specifically designed to be alive and instructive and empowering. The Native American myths and stories do come to life when they're told by Cherokee poet, writer, and storyteller Mary Lou Awiokta of Memphis. Here for Tennessee Kaleidoscope, she explains her name, Awiokta, and its connection with the myth of little deer. In the Cherokee, Awiokta means eye of the deer. I of the deer, and it's my spirit name. It's the name of of my of how I am. And Is that why there's so many deer yeah. in your house? And yeah. I see you have one around your neck and all. Right. The the one around my neck is the logo I designed of my life and work, and it's the sacred deer of the Cherokee, the Awiusti deer or the little deer, and the myth is or the teaching is that when the hunter went hunting. Um, he had to ask pardon of the deer spirit when he killed it for taking its life so that his could go on. And then if the the little deer, the Awius D, came and asked the blood on the ground, has the hunter prayed the words of pardon? If the hunter had, if he'd been a reverent hunter, then the spirit deer, the little deer, blessed the hunt. But if he'd been irreverent, then little deer tracked the hunter to his home and crippled him so he never could hunt again. And this was used to teach the concept that if you take from nature, you must give back, always in the circle. You know, never take without giving back. Native Americans in general had different myths similar to Little Deer. Uh, but this is how the concept was taught of the balance of nature and the reverence and respect for our Mother Earth. Have you written some stories about that particular myth? Yes, Abiding uh, Appalachia has the original myth in it, a retelling of the original myth. And then I use Little Deer in many capacities. For example, you see I put him in the uh, atomic orbit because I grew up in Oak Ridge. And the reason I put uh, Little Deer in the atomic orbit is to show my belief that in modern times, if we maintain the reverence for the earth and the creator and people, we can live in harmony. And otherwise, we're going to destroy ourselves. You know, and we know that so well now from Chernobyl and the, uh, what can happen with the atom if we're irreverent with it. Mary Lou Awiokta's book, Abiding Appalachia, Where Mountain and Atom Meet, is a collection of stories and poetry relating to her early life in Oak Ridge. Another of her books is Rising Fawn and the Fire Mystery, based on an event in the life of a Choctaw child during the Trail of Tears in 1833. Rising Fawn is a, is a true story, though some of it necessarily is fictionalized. The basic storyline is true. And the detail about the family was taken from a journal of a Choctaw family who lived in that area. And as it turned out, the artist who did the book, Beverly Bringle, um, it was her ancestor who lived in the same place that Rising Fawn lived, and it was his journal. The family very kindly allowed me to use some detail out of his journal. So it's not a theoretical way of how a family prepared for the Trail of Tears. It is the way a family prepared. Mm -hmm. You know, So the book is being used a lot in Native American studies. Rising Fawn and Abiding Appalachia, both published by St. Luke's Press in Memphis, more about Mary Lou Awiokta, her writings, and her deep interest in the heritage and culture of Native Americans in a future segment of Tennessee Kaleidoscope. This program, made possible with the joint support of the National Endowment for the Arts and the Tennessee Arts Commission, this is Lynn Folk. There was a boy that came over here a couple of summers ago from Italy how he had heard about Gallagher guitars was in a library in Italy. 
he was going through books about guitars, and there was a book published in England called uh, The Guitar from Renaissance to Rock, and uh, there were some pictures of Gallagher guitars in there. He brought the book with him, a copy of the book. It was a full-page picture of one of our guitars. The book mentioned that the Gallagher guitar was made in Wartrace, Tennessee, famous for its walking horses and the historic Walking Horse Hotel. Like so many small towns in Middle Tennessee, the train comes through Wartrace every day, and one did come by while Don Gallagher, proprietor of Gallagher Guitar, was relating for Tennessee Kaleidoscope the history of this family business. My father started in woodworking in 1939, making furniture. Most of that was uh, custom-built furniture, one-of-a-kind type of items, where somebody would bring in a picture or an idea, and he would first design the furniture and then build it. And he did that uh, until the early 60s, basically. And that's when we started gradually getting into building guitars. There are th three uh, instruments here in the display case and that are somewhat representative of what we've done the last 20 years. The instrument on the extreme left is one that my father and I built about 1964. I made the body for it and he made the neck that particular guitar was significant to us in that it was the very first one that had the curve in the top of the headstock, the French curve, which has become our trademark. And at the time we made it, um, my grandmother had a paisley print dress, which is where I got the idea for the little curly cue that's in the top of it. The instrument in the center is really the first Gallagher guitar assess that my father made in May of 1965. It's a G50 model. Uh, G, of course, for Gallagher, and 50 because my father was 50 years of age at the time, so we thought that was as, as good a way as any as starting a uh, nomenclature. The instrument on the extreme right is a 71 Special model, and it's the 1,000th guitar that we finished up. Presently, we make 14 different uh, models in four different body sizes, either out of rosewood or mahogany for the backs and sides, spruce for the tops, ebony or rosewood for the fingerboards, and uh, uh, mother of pearl or abalone inlays uh, in the fingerboard and in the head plate, and ivory for the nuts and saddles and the instruments. Do you do all the work here? We do basically all the work here. Right now, there's a, a gentleman in Germany that uh, makes some of the inlays for us and sends them to us, and uh, we inlay them here at the shop. But basically, we get all the woods all the materials uh, raw, and we process it from the raw material to the finished product here at Wartrace. Where does your wood come from? Most of the woods that we get, we get from mills in western Germany. We use a rosewood, which comes from East India, and mahogany from Africa for the, for the bodies, uh, spruce from Alaska for the tops, ebony uh, comes either from Africa or some of it comes from India. All the wood, when we get it, is what's called quarter sawn. That is, the log has been cut so that the grain is vertical in it to make the wood stronger. And the first thing that we do is put the wood up on curing racks here in the shop. And right now we've got enough wood for a little over a thousand instruments here curing, which is important not only for the stability, but also for the tonal qualities of the wood. Because when we ship instruments out of here, we ship them literally all over the world. I think the farthest that we've ever shipped a guitar has been to Jerusalem. And the, the farthest that somebody has ever come to Wartrace to pick up an instrument that we've made for them has been Saudi Arabia. But we ship to, to Western Europe on a fairly regular basis, and of course, all over the United States. Not only that, people nowadays uh, are so mobile particularly professional musicians are traveling and, and, and experiencing different climates and temperatures all the time, that it's very important for the woods to be just as stable as possible. Don Gallagher, proprietor of J.W. Gallagher & Son, makers of handcrafted guitars in Wartrace, Tennessee. This program made possible with the joint support of the National Endowment for the Arts and the Tennessee Arts Commission, for Tennessee Kaleidoscope, this is Lynn Folk.
We give readings of individual poems. We give readings of multi-voice poems and some very dramatic ones. We do lots of funny things. We do lots of serious things. We do old poems. We do new poems. We try to read good poems. And we found it very successful in making people say, hey, this is enjoyable, I like this. Dr. Paul Ramsey, poet in residence and professor of English at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga, who's the founder and leader of the Brown House Readers. This group of seven people meets twice a month to read poetry and prepare for reading performances. In addition to just reading, they work on choreography, staging, and movement for their professional presentations. The Brown House Readers are a group that gives public readings of poems. We've given them in Nashville, in Knoxville, in Chattanooga, in Georgia, and we have a great time doing it. It's not officially really a UTC group, though we've had a little support from Most of the people that have some connection with UTC. The history of it, the Brown House had nothing to do originally with me or with the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. It was an, sort of an artist colony. Several years ago, uh, there were musicians there, there were artists there, there were writers there, and they asked me to give some workshops for them in writing. That's where it began. It began as a writer's workshop uh, and was connected there, the writer's workshop I did at Chattanooga State, and some of those carried over. Well, the writer's workshop is sort of in abeyance right now because the reader's workshop has been so much fun. A performance usually consists of about 30 short selections from poets such as John Maysfield, T.S. Eliot, Sandberg, Frost, Shakespeare, current poets, and some well-known Tennessee writers. But hardly ever do members of the company read their own poetry. We don't read our own pieces. We did once. In Knoxville, we gave a double reading because people wanted us to. But primarily, uh, we read things of, other, of real poets, we like to say, uh, from Shakespeare uh, through to current times and some names unknown. I observed your performance at Harpeth Hall in, in Nashville. Well, that was probably our most successful one. The, the, well, I was the, amazed the at the reaction, and, and you said that you did some funny things and some serious things, and this was certainly an example of that. The audience laughed at the, at the funny ones, and they applauded for the serious ones, and I think you had a Standing ovation at the yeah, end. They were, they were a great audience. From the tenth, our rehearsals now are ended. These are actors, as I foretold you, were all spirits, and are vanished into air, into thin air. And like the baseless fabric of this vision, the cloud capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples, the great globe itself, all which you shall inherit shall dissolve. Like this insubstantial pageant faded, leave not a rack behind. We are, we are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. And we do it just for fun, and we aren't vastly ambitious of this stuff. And we also try to help the cause of good poetry by reading poems which are interesting and which represent a variety of things. You said that most of the time you did not read your own poetry. Are all of the readers poets in addition to their regular professions? Most of them wouldn't call themselves that. All have written some, but I don't think most of them would call themselves writers. Again, it seems to me there are many too many pretentious writers going around being pretentious writers, and we like to be an exception to that, but also do a very good job. Do you know of other poetry reading groups in Tennessee or other places? Not really. Uh, sometimes Readers Theater uh, does poetry and the like, but groups that just go around reading poetry are, are, are surprisingly few. You'd think they'd be much more common. The Brown House Readers of Chattanooga, Trish Heiler, John Gaunt, Helen Arthur, Charles Mann, Lou Ann Prater-Smith, Mike Richards, and heard here, Paul Ramsey. This program made possible with the joint support of the National Endowment for the Arts and the Tennessee Arts Commission. For Tennessee Kaleidoscope, this is Lynn Folk. <laughs>